history as a performing <laughs> musician, and he could give us a rap. I don't think that. Yeah, no, really I'm not going to do that. No. So, so we might move that out of the way soon. So, um, for the other, those of you who didn't come to uh, Dan's seminar yesterday, um, Dan's been brought here as part of the CTBCC program for science and engagement. So thanks very much to the CTBCC for that. Uh, Dan has broad interests in the fields such as ecology, evolution, and bioinformatics. And he did his PhD at UC Davis with Michael Torelli and Peter Wainwright. Since then, he's been awarded three internationally competitive fellowships, two in the US and one here. He's now on a decra at Macquarie University down in Sydney. Um, you may be familiar with Dan's work, and if you aren't already, you will be by the end of today. <laughs> so one sure. of the uh, software packages he's uh, written with his colleagues is called NM Tools, which is what we're going to use today. And another one is called Are We There Yet? AWTY, that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and finally, he wrote a, such an excellent review on exactly what he's going to talk to you about today that it was published in the journal Tree and it became the most downloaded paper of 2014 for Tree. So we're really lucky to have Dan today. So thanks so much for taking the time to come and teach us. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. Um, yeah, so. I have to preface all this by saying this is the first time I, I've given this workshop and, and uh, uh, giving it to so many people for the first time is, is kind of crazy. Uh, but it also means that when we get to the technical bits, because we've got so many people here who could potentially have run into problems, uh, uh, I'm not necessarily going to be able to stop whenever uh, um, whenever someone hits a problem. So we've got these things. I'm just blatantly stealing ideas from the software carpentry people here. Everyone gets a green post-it note and a pink post-it note. So take one and, and, and uh, pass them around. And basically, if everything's put one on the back of your laptop here, and if everything's going well, you should have a green post-it note there, right? So I can look out there and see hopefully a sea of green. It should be beautiful. And if you hit a snag, hit a pink thing. Uh, or put a pink one up. And, and your neighbors can help you or, or someone nearby can help you. Uh, um, or if I see a whole bunch of pink go up simultaneously, I know that we've, you know, I really screwed something up, and I'll stop, and we'll see if we can figure out what the problem is. The other thing we're going to do here, for those of you who have internet access, uh, which is hopefully more, uh, most of you, we have this thing here called an Etherpad. It's this really cool thing where basically everybody in the class can share the same notepad. I've already put the, the outline I sent to, to Megan the other day up here. And what it, what it is, if you just go to this URL up there, can you see that? It's, it's kind of small. Um, you can follow along here, and you can add your own stuff here. You can take notes on all the stuff I've said. Uh, and, and you can chat down here in this window. You say, uh, 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 you know, I have no idea what that meant. Oh, I didn't mean to hit cat all caps there. Anyway, but you can say that, and then, and then you, can, you can chat to each other and sort of work through stuff over here. Particularly if you had a simple technical problem, you know, that the, oh, hey, how did, I do, how did he do that? Or, or uh, uh, I can't get this thing to do that. Down there in the chat is a great place to do that, and maybe someone from the other side of the room can help you out without having to stop and get up and all that stuff. And then at the end of the day, if everyone's taking notes over here uh, uh, and keeping track of what's going on and explaining things better than this outline does, um, uh, we can export this as a text file or an HTML file, and you can sort of take this home as, as your notes to look back on the class. So it's, it's a very handy thing uh, uh, if people use it. Yeah, so go ahead and put your name in there when you log in. So. People know who you are. Um, I, I can't access the edu room anywhere in the world, apparently. Uh, so I'm going off my phone. So I may run out of internet access in a few hours. Uh, um, but uh, uh, until that happens, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the uh, etherpad. Somehow Dan just managed to write that to us while he was working, right? What's that? Oh, me? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this. This outline looked beautiful in Word, but it didn't paste in the Etherpad right. So if you if you find that formatting terrible, it is. Feel free to fix it as you go along. But just yeah, add your notes, your ideas, uh, things like that. All right, cool. So I'm gonna get that out of the way. Oh yeah. So lunch is at noon. Afternoon tea is at three thirty. Yeah. Uh, these are approximate because again, I haven't given this workshop before, so we'll see. Uh, well, I've given it to to my my wife and to my cats, and those those were about right. But you know, cats are pretty on the ball with this stuff. So, okay, here we go. All right, let's close that. Um, so I'm going to start from the very very basics. Uh, um, 
Yes. Okay. And for those of you who saw my talk yesterday, some bits of this may be a little bit of a repeat, but in much more depth. Uh, so I'm going to talk just about the, the kind of concepts of what we're doing here, why we take this approach. And then in this first bit, we're going to do a quick little Maxent demo. A lot of you have probably already done Maxent before, but we're, for those of you who haven't, we're going to run through a quick Maxent model and what the outputs of that are and what they mean. And then uh, uh, um, for the next part, we're going to get into sort of just kind of basic concepts and using these things in ecological biogeography, right? And then we'll have some lunch. All right. Oh, we've already done this stuff. Make sure you have a pink post-it note mm -hmm. and a green one. Yes. Okay. Uh, we've covered that. And then the ether pad. Yes. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> I did hit record, right? going. I forget how you tell with Camtasia that you're actually recording. Yes, I'm actually recording. So, that'll be on the internet. All right. Uh, <laughs> cool. So, for a whole lot of things in biology and population biology, we have questions where we'd like to know something about a species' environmental tolerances. So, this is roughly speaking the idea of the fundamental niche, or just the niche. Um, and this is the idea that within some space of environmental variables, here we've got temperature and precipitation, there's some subset of that space within which our species can maintain a population that's reproducing at a rate sufficient to replace itself. So within that area of environment space, it's happy, and outside, it's not happy. Okay? So, yeah, that's very straightforward. We want to know this for conservation biology quite often because it's one of the primary filters that we often need to place on whether or not a particular patch of habitat is, is a high priority for conservation. It's not always the case because sometimes we need dispersal corridors and things like that, but often that's, that's pretty important to know. So I'm actually originally an evolutionary biologist, and that was my original uh, interest in these things. And as an evolutionary biologist, this is the sort of thing I want to know because this is the aspect of a species' relationship to its environment that's set very directly by its environmental tolerances and preferences. So it's relatively simple to see how this could respond to natural selection. So as an evolutionary biologist, this is at least the easiest niche to deal with, uh, or arguably one of the more interesting versions of it, but yeah. Okay. So it's a simple idea. And it suggests a really simple research program, right? You take your species, you raise them at a bunch of temperatures, and you see how they do. Yeah? You raise them at a bunch of moisture regimes, and you see how they do. And then you get some estimate of the niche from that. But we did those experiments separately in this little thing I just made up there. And in the imaginary niche I showed you, there's actually a correlation between the species tolerances for these things. So it can handle higher temperatures if it's wetter out. Now, if we do those experiments separately, we could either drastically underestimate or overestimate that area of environment space that's suitable for our species, which could lead to either failing to conserve suitable habitat or sinking money into habitat that's not suitable for your species in terms of the conservation stuff. In the evolutionary stuff, it just means you get the wrong answer and someone writes a paper calling you an idiot. Okay, either way, it's not good, but the conservation implications are a little bit worse than just you seeming foolish. Okay. So, you need to estimate correlations, right? Which means you need a lot more frogs and a lot more boxes. And you need an experimental apparatus that allows you to manipulate multiple environmental axes simultaneously. So this gets expensive. You need more frogs, you need more space, you need more people, you need more money. And we, that's often the, the limiting factor there. <clears throat> So I'm not saying that this isn't a great thing to do. If you actually want to understand the species tolerances, this is, I think, unarguably probably the best way to do it. Um, it's just that it's a, even in the, for the systems for which this is possible, it's not easy. And there's a whole bunch of species that are simply intractable for any one of a number of reasons. So if you start thinking about this research program applied to elephants, you hit a fairly obvious snag right off the bat. I mean, they're too big to fit into little boxes. And, and even if you could fit them into a box that would keep them alive, it wouldn't really be ecologically relevant, right? Because they have huge home ranges. So you need an apparatus that looks like this. And then you actually need to be able to manipulate your environmental variables along that sort of, uh, 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 along that, that, that big of a, a, um, a space, which is a, a big problem. Uh, when you're talking about comparative studies, you want to look at a whole bunch of species. Well, then you sort of take all the problems for a single species and you multiply them by however many species you want to compare. So that gets huge really quick. When you talk about threatened and endangered species, I mean, there's an obvious problem there. You, you can't get your animal, and even if you could, 
a lot of people quite reasonably would not like you to take them into captivity and raise them under conditions which are going to negatively impact the fitness of what could be a substantial chunk of the extant members of your species. And then, of course, you've got some environmental variables that are, are important to species that are very difficult to manipulate. So all these things basically make it really difficult in a lot of cases to get the data we want to estimate the thing we're interested in. So we, we, we don't live in that world quite often where we can get the data we want. We live in the world where we try to figure out how to do something useful with the data we can get. And that's really, I think, an important perspective to have on these sorts of models. It's a lot of kind of, um, I think, more sort of classical field ecologist types look at these things and say, and actually, did, so this is, this is an aside here, I guess, but this is literally the first thing I ever remember actually saying about these, these models, these methods. Uh, um, uh, was I was reading a paper uh, in a lab group, and I said, that's not the niche. What the hell are you talking about? I mean, that was, that was basically my introduction to these things. And as I looked more and more into them, I was like, oh, wait a second. Oh, yeah, okay, I could see, yeah, you could do something useful there. And as time's gone on, I've been more and more convinced that these, these are worth doing. But it is important to keep that perspective on it, that um, uh, this is not the best way to estimate the niche. This is often the only possible way we can get any useful information about it. And so that's, that's I, I think, the perspective I want you to retain. OK. But maintain that skepticism if you have it. And if you don't, cultivate that skepticism, because it keeps you honest, and, and it, I think it makes your models better. OK. So that's a bit of an aside. What I was saying is, this is where we sort of look at what we can what we can do with sorts of data that we, uh, with the sorts of data that we can access, and, and for a lot of species, even if we know nothing else about them, we kind of know what they look like, <laughs> or and or we we know where we've seen them before. And in this day and age, that often means very fine scale geo reference locality data for our species. So we we often know to within a few meters where we've seen them before. And. Uh, Nowadays, we also have very fine-scale uh, uh, climate surfaces for a bunch of things we think might be important to a bunch of species. And this is really useful because if we know where we've seen them in geographic space, that means we know where we've seen them in climate space, approximately. And then we can use that, that that's, uh, uh, data to, to estimate something about their environmental tolerances. And there's tons of data for this stuff. So... A lot of you are probably familiar with this. This is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Basically, they aggregate collection records from museums all over the world. Not all of those are geo-referenced. Not all of them are trustworthy, and definitely be aware of that. But there's a heck of a lot of it. So almost 530 million uh, records as of a few days ago. 1.6 million species. That's a lot of data. And so there we go, I guess. That's kind of the broad idea of these things, the environmental niche models, species distribution models, whatever you want to call them. So because they are very tractable and they provide things that we find useful for a lot of uh, uh, studies, they've absolutely exploded across uh, evolution ecology and conservation biology in the past decade. So this is the percent growth in the use of these methods as a function. I don't know if you can see this line, but down at the bottom, that's the percent growth in the, the number of papers in that set of journals. And that, that top dash line is the percent growth in the, per, in the percentage of those papers that use um, uh, these methods. So about a, probably about a 2,500% increase in less than a decade. So really, really widely used. All right, so before we go any further, we're going to get hands-on really quickly. We're going to do a quick demo of Maxent. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and then we're just going to look at, at what sorts of things we're doing here. So. Um, if you don't have Maxent, uh, it's probably a little too late for you to download it for the demo, but you can get it over lunch. You can just do the, get the first Google hit for Maxent, that'll actually take you to their web page. You may need to install Java, um, but you probably already have that. And then what you need is uh, some occurrence data, and this is just species name, Latin long, in a, a comma-separated values file, which you can export from Excel. And then you need some environment data. And this is a picture of what that environment data looks like. Uh, uh, you know, just it's basically been converted into a bitmap. But what it really looks like is it's this stuff you download from from World Clam or somewhere like that, or layers you can get from uh, 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 the Atlas of Living Australia and stuff. And uh, when you actually look inside those things in a text editor, this is what that data looks like. So you've got this header, which is these first six rows here, which basically just tells the tells the the, the program how big your grid is, where the lower left corner of it is in geographic space how big the grid cells are. So you can use that for, for uh, putting your points in space. 
And then this thing that says uh, no data values, that's, area, that's actually grid cells where you don't have any data. So like here, we're actually, this is actually looking at this same layer. That top left corner there, you can see that's all, that's ocean, so we don't have any data there. So if we're looking at the top left corner of that grid file, it's all no data values. Okay. So now we're going to build a really quick maxint model for a couple of anole species. So these are, these are lizards. These are from, this, this is the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. Uh, that's where Haiti and Dominican Republic are located. And we've got two species in all of our examples today. Uh, pretty much are going to be these two species. There's this northern one, it's called Anolis chlorocyanus, that lives north of this biogeographic boundary called Merton's Line. And the southern one is called Anolis celestinus, which lives south of that biogeographic boundary. And so that's what we're going to model right now. So we're going to stop here. We're going to launch Maxint, for those of you who want to play along at home. Okay. So we're going to go to our demos folder here. And uh, for most of you, you probably should just be able to double-click maxent.jar. So did everyone get the demos folder? Did we pass that around? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that probably 20 or 30 times today. So I'm going to have to keep switching back and forth between mirroring my desktop and extending my desktop. And, and I forgot to do it there. So, we good? So you can hit Browse. You're going to uh, uh, head to wherever you store your demos file. So now we're browsing for our samples. This is our point data. So mine's on my desktop. Uh, there we go. It's under sample data. So for right now, we've got a bunch of different files here. These are actually different ways of sort of mangling the data of these same two species. We're going to choose the one. It's the third one down here. For me, at least. It says chlorocyanocelestinusmaxent.csv. And this just loaded in the point data for those two species. Now we're going to hit Browse again, and you need to select the folder, but don't double-click it. Just select the folder, Hispaniola World Clem, and hit Choose. And now that's loaded in our environmental variables. So this is temperature, precipitation, stuff like that. These are the, uh, the 19 bioclim variables, if you want to look those up, uh, uh, and uh, altitude. And so we're going to hit Create Response Curves, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and do jackknife to measure variable importance. So there's different options here for what you can do as part of that thing. We need to uh, uh, select an output directory. So here you hit browse, and we're going to have to go up a directory. We'll go to demos, max end output. We'll just hit choose there. Everyone green? All right, good. And there's, uh, I'm going to uh, point you to a few more settings here. So um, hit the settings button. We're going to ignore most of this, but what we're going to do here is we're going to tell it to set aside some percentage of our data for each of those species. We're going to pick, let's say, 30%. Let's just put a 30 there. And what it's going to do is it's going to take randomly 70% of our data and use that to build a model, and then it's going to give us some evaluation statistics based on the 30% that it did not use to build the model. So this is a sort of uh, uh, kind of a random subsetting thing that we use to make sure that our model is hopefully not overfit to our training data. No talk about that in detail in a bit. All right, so we'll just hit uh, OK there, or just close it, and then we hit Run. And uh, um, this is probably going to take about five minutes or so. So does anyone have any problems right now? I know it's a bit early for people to need to run to the restroom, but... Uh, if anyone missed what the has, um, zero, no, the back of the room there, and the how many of you have not used Maxent before? Oh, wow, it's more than I would have thought. Okay, all right, great. Well, it's an incredibly easy to use piece of software. It's, uh, and you'll see the output of it is beautiful. It writes half the paper for you. It's amazing. And I actually, you know, looking back at that explosive growth of these methods across this literature, I think it's primarily due to the ease of use of Maxent. Um, it's amazing how much effect easy to use software has on, on any sort of literature. Um, yeah, the easiest to use tool is almost always the most used tool, regardless of its merit. So I, I honestly feel like in this literature, uh, we are fortunate. There are a lot of sort of anti-maxent modeling hipsters out there, but I think we're fortunate that the, uh, 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 the easiest to use method we've got is one of the best. Maybe not the best, but it's still pretty darn good compared to some of the other stuff we've got. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, this might take a while. <laughs> Any questions so far?
Nobody? Uh, why do I say niche instead of niche? Yeah. Is that a good kind uh, Because uh, I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of them do, yeah, yeah. It, it seems to be, if you're, if you're raised within uh, uh, 20 miles of the coast, you might say niche. Particularly the West Coast, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I went to school close to the West Coast, and a lot of people said niche so there. Niche. Uh, everyone who's from Berkeley says niche, I think, or at least a lot of them, yes. Mm. Uh, so 30% is what people often do. There was a study, oh, I can't remember who did it, but it was a long time ago, basically asking what the optimal training and test percentage is. It's going to be dependent, uh, honestly, on how much data you've got. If you've got, you know, if you've got lots of data points, then yeah, it, it probably won't make too much difference if, whether, if you did 10 or 30. If you had a very few data points and you set aside 30%, then you're not giving your model very much information to go on. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Honestly, I don't think it makes a huge difference. And it, as, as we go on a little bit later, I'll, I'll talk about why I think this, this test that you see is useful, but not as useful as, as I think it appears at first glance. Um, yeah. So 30 is just, it's, again, it's just what most people do. This, this literature is full of rules of thumb, you know, things that seem like a good idea, and then enough people have done them that they seem built into the process. And... Uh, um, there really has not, in a lot of cases, been systematic evaluation of the effects of those things. And to the extent that there has been, and I'll talk about this a little more, I think the system, some of the, a lot of the systematic evaluations we have done of some of these modeling choices could be actually quite misleading. Yeah. So, uh, oh, at least we're on to Celestinus now. That's a, we're halfway through. <clears throat> I should have brought a guitar or something. Uh, yeah, I could, uh, well. <laughs> uh, don't think I remember all the words today. Yeah. Um, hmm. Any other questions? This will, we're going we're gonna to have a few of these uh, uh, down periods. Some of these things take a while to run, so yeah. Uh, it depends on what sort of mistake it is. Yeah, so if it's, if it's, uh, if it's a mistake in georeferencing so that it falls outside of your study area, it'll pop up and say there's, a, there's no data for this point. And you can tell it to stop, or you can just say suppress similar visual, uh, visual warnings and chuck all that stuff away. Um, other, I, yeah, I think most other errors, that some of it will sort of barf and die, but, but uh, yeah, it just depends on what kind of error it is. Yeah. Mm. Oh, the, the climate layers can be as broad as they want. Yeah, it's just, you can. It's, yeah, or, yeah, it's, it's rarely a good idea to do that. But the, so I did a thing, we didn't quite do that, but we, uh, we were working on a Parthenium weed, which is pretty much globally distributed except for the poles. And there's a few places it hasn't gotten to yet, but it's probably mostly just because it hasn't gotten there yet. And so... We, so I, I was, you know, in the middle of a very large group of people on this project, but there was a whole lot of exploration of, of that, that sort of issue. What do you do with a species that's gotten almost everywhere? Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, so we tried different approaches there. That, it's, not, it's not published yet, and it's not mine to talk about, so I can't talk about what we found. But, uh, yeah, you can do the whole world if you have some reason to. You could throw in space if you had reason to, I suppose. Oh, about space? <laughs> Ocean. So people do do some uh, environmental niche modeling in, yeah, in, in marine environments. And in some cases, I think, I, in some cases, it, it really depends on the question, whether that's, that's a reasonable thing to do or, or, oh, I think, weird. So, like, I, my, my field work is actually reef fish, and I've never done any of this sort of modeling on reef fish because... You know, the primary determinant of where reef fish go is where the reef is, right? And that's, so like I, I work in the Caribbean a whole lot, and you're looking at, you know, the, the, a lot of the variables we've got are like sea surface temperature, you know, salinity, pH, you know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, if you built a model for these, first of all, a lot of those variables, these fish don't care about directly in any sense whatsoever. 
the reef might, but the fish doesn't. But then even once you sort of get that set of sea surface conditions down, uh, well, then it's going to tell you that most of the Gulf of Mexico is suitable for your species. And that's not true. It's actually a, a 20 meter wide band around the Gulf of Mexico that's suitable for your species. And so the predictions you get out of it uh, uh, are often not particularly useful. Now, if you have substrate stuff or if you have variables that are actually important to your species or at a scale that's relevant to d predicting the distribution that you care about, then that I think it makes perfect sense. There's no reason you couldn't do it. It's just, in most cases, getting the data that's relevant to your species is, is quite difficult in that context. Okay, uh, we, we have a, a result. Does someone have, what? <laughs> Did someone have another question? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that makes a little, I mean, it maybe makes a little more sense, I mean, because, because the pelagic fish would actually not be so, you know, attached to this, this thing that usually is not in your data set, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, I, I skipped over something there. If you go to the, the output folder you pointed to, what you've got is a couple of HTML files. So uh, Maxent makes a bunch of plots, it calculates a bunch of statistics, and then it builds you a little sort of locally stored web page. You don't have to have an internet connection for this. It's all stored on your computer. That basically contains all of your results, and it's lovely. So we're just going to pop through this really quick here so you can see where everything is. Uh, there's this whole stuff on, um, basically, this is talking about how good your model is, and I'll give you this, I'll give you this in detail in just a second. This is the ROC curve I'm going to talk about a lot in just a minute. Uh, these are some thresholds you can use if you have some criterion where you want to say above this criterion, oh sorry, above this threshold, uh, I'm going to predict that as a presence for my species, or I'm below it, it's an absence, so converting it to predict a presence and absence, uh, as opposed to continuous suitability scores, which is what it by default spits out. So this is the actual map of your prediction. This is across Hispaniola what we've predicted about the suitability of habitat for this species. Yeah? Beautiful. The white points there are the training points that we use to build your models. The purple points are the test points that some of our statistics are evaluated on. Going down here, these are marginal estimates of habitat suitability as the function of a, a, each individual environmental variable. So this is what Maxent thinks your species response to SNV15 is, whatever that is. That's the 15th biochem variable, which I can't recall the top of my head. Uh, just to point this out, you can see the response to some of these predictors is a little ragged. I think this is a bigger problem than most people seem to think this is. Uh, we'll talk about that later too, though. <laughs> and uh, this is a different way of estimating importance. And then you can actually, or uh, response, and then you can actually get down here to estimates of how important different variables are to explaining the distribution of your species. And there's a bunch of different ways that it kind of estimates that. Okay? So you see, you get this whole web page to explore. It's, it's beautiful. And all of that happened automatically just by pushing a couple buttons. So it's about the most output for the least effort you can get from a piece of scientific software, which again is probably a large chunk of why it's so popular. But it's also pretty good. So everyone get that? Okay. So as I showed you, this is, this is what our prediction looks like in terms of continuous estimates of habitat suitability. So these cooler colors are what we estimate to be poor quality habitat. The warmer the color is, the better the quality you're predicting. Um, it's hard to evaluate model fit in an intuitive way using these continuous scores, so we have a way of, of kind of getting around that, and that's this plot that's called uh, uh, the ROC plot. So this st that stands for no reason you need to know this, but it stands for the Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve. Um, it's, I think we actually stole this from medical science, where it's used, I think it's, what is it, ascertainment based on tests or something like that. Like, they, they would use this thing to evaluate the success rates of a, of a, a test for cancer, things like that. Anyway, so what this is, is... Let's say, let's go back to this. Let's say we wanted to establish a threshold for converting these continuous scores into presence and absence. So let's say the highest score in our space is 0.9 and our threshold is 1. How many cell, grid cells do we predict as present? Zero. And for our actual data, our point data, how many of those do we predict as present? The answer is zero. 
But now if we slide that threshold down, we start predicting more and more grid cells as presence, and then we also predict more and more of our data points as present. And then so, you, so the, here you're actually sort of measuring that trade-off there. Because ideally what you want, from a perfect model of the data, not of the niche, um, an ideal model would be one where as soon as you sort of move that threshold down to where you start predicting anywhere, you only predict where your data is. Yeah? Okay. So this is kind of what that looks like, just to illustrate. Can everyone see down here? So brown means we're not predicting there. So this is with that threshold set so, set high, so high you're not making a prediction of presence here. As you move, and this is, this is where we are here. So the fractional predicted area is this x-axis. So that's basically saying how much of this area are we predicting with a given threshold. The y-axis is how many of our uh, uh, points are we predicting. And so the red line is our training data. That's the data the model had available to it. The blue line is our test data, that random subset of the data we set aside. So we're saying, as you increase the area you predict, how do you increase your predictions of your trading and your test data? So we can move that threshold down, and you can barely see it there. We get a little sprinkling of points there, so we're still playing. Then we move it down some more, so we predict more area, and more area, and more area. And so here we're, I don't know, what's that, 10%? You know? And we're predicting that many of those points. And as we just move that threshold down and down and down and down, we predict more and more of the area. But now we're getting to the point where we're predicting a lot of places where our species isn't. So our, our sensitivity may be high, but our fractional predicted area is also high. So we're just measuring the trade-off between these things, right? And that's all this ROC curve does. It's a very handy way to think about what a model in this sort of sense does, because it's not dependent on any particular threshold. It's just saying how selective your model is in general. But we can summarize this by taking the area under this curve. So that perfect model, as soon as you were to predict, predict that your species was anywhere, you would have to predict it was everywhere. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. As soon as you predicted it was anywhere, you would have to predict all of your data. That's a perfect model. You make any prediction, it's a perfect prediction. And that would mean you would go from that 0, 0 to 0, 1. Right? And so th this is the performance of a perfect model on this metric. And you can take the area under that curve, and that area under that curve is 1, because we're going from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. Yeah? So that's an AUC score. Now, a random model, a completely uninformative model, would not have an AUC of 0, because any model is going to make a prediction. So a random model, if you just sort of predicted randomly grid cells across your space, let's say you predicted half of them, What's the chance that you include any given point? Half? Half. Yes. And if you, if you predicted 70% of the areas present, then you're going to predict 70% of your points on average, right? And so the actual uh, rate you predict there is this line here. It's the sort of unity line where if you're predicting a tenth of the area, you're predicting a tenth of your points. That's the expectation for an uninformative model. So the area under that curve is 0.5. So typically, we expect this metric to range from 1 for a perfect model to 0 0.5 for an uninformative model. We'll follow up on that later because it's not necessarily true. But it's something that everyone believes, which I guess is the important thing. <laughs> uh, sorry. So I, 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 if it's not clear, I have a habit of, of uh, constantly thinking about the problems with methods and stuff. It's sort of one of my favorite hobbies is being sort of bleak about science. Uh, but... Uh, uh, this is, yeah, it's perfectly acceptable. People use this all the time. Uh, um, I just like making fun of stuff that people love. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of choices you have to make here. Uh, and I talked to you yesterday about how these contribute to uncertainty in, in, uh, in your models and your modeling outcomes. So you've got to talk about curating points, so picking stuff that actually represents your species, uh, getting rid of errors in georeferencing, taxonomic mis-ID, stuff like that. Picking the right environmental variables, Picking the right study area for, for selecting your background data or your absences. Picking the right algorithm, complexity, types of responses, all that sort of stuff. So you've got to make so many choices every time you go to the board with this stuff. And uh, um, a lot of those, there's really not necessarily good objective criteria for telling when you've made the right decision versus when you haven't. So um, if you saw my talk yesterday, you saw that, I mean, I said I, one of my favorite things to explore here is uncertainty. And I think it's very, very important to explore the space of uncertainty you have in these models anytime you do them seriously. So, 
uh, what are we doing here? What's the idea? What are we trying to model? Uh, there's this whole argument that's been going on since these things have been around about whether we're modeling niches or distributions. A lot of people prefer to call these things species distribution models. I'm not offended by that. I, tell, I call them species distribution models all the time too. But uh, I do want to be clear what the underlying concept is because I think they're, modeling a distribution and modeling niche are two very separate things. And I think modeling distributions when our actual goal is to model a niche is one of the biggest problems we have. So this is, we're lapsing now into a bit of an opinion piece. Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll stick with me. All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> a first caveat. When I say I think we're modeling the niche, I do not mean I think we're modeling it well. So often I think that's one of the, the, the sort of mistakes people say, uh, make when they hear someone say something about niche modeling, is this idea that, oh, that means I think we've built a great model of the species environmental tolerances. Sometimes that's probably true, Often it's probably not necessarily true. But again, what I'm trying to do is something useful, not something perfect. And I think as long as we can do that, we're good. So to get at why there's a disconnect there, so Soberon and Peterson uh, uh, published this thing they call the BAM model, which is saying there's this abiotic niche, that's the A, that we like to know about. But there's only a subset of that environment space that's biotically suitable for our species, and only a subset of that that's within our, within our species' uh, uh, dispersal capability. So that's the intersection of the biotic, abiotic, and mobility niches. That's where our data comes from, and that's what our model's mostly going to look like, right? So that's the idea there. It's a really good way to visualize this stuff because it's nice and simple, but it doesn't, I think, rep accurately represent the carnage that's present in real data. So I made my own, I call the DAM diagram, which doesn't stand for anything, but it's just you sort of look at it and you go, damn. Um, <laughs> And, and, and uh, I, this is just, it includes what I think, when I think about where this data comes from compared to what we're trying to estimate, this is how I think about it. So this is our species set of abiotic tolerances. And ideally, we collect presence points for our species from within that uh, space and absence or pseudo-absence points from outside of that space. And then we build that model and it'd be perfect and we'd be happy. But the real world interferes, as it often does. And in this case, I actually really mean the real world is interfering because not every combination of environmental variables is present in the real world at any given time, certainly not in your study area. So in order for this, you know, to do this really well, what you need is you need this sort of even unbiased sampling of this environment space. That doesn't happen anywhere. Seriously. So there's, there's, there's combinations of environments that it may even be the best habitat for your species that you may not be able to sample your species from. And not only that, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a weird one. I think this is one that, that it's, it's, it's hard to think about because it's not just that you can't get your species from there. And that's, that means you can't get your species from there if you sample every member of your species and if you sample every grid cell on the face of the earth. You can't get your species from there, but you also can't even get pseudo-absence or absence data from there because there's no grid cell in the earth that represents that area of environment space. So there can be these huge chunks of possible environments that our models fundamentally cannot be informative about in any way, given distribution data. So, how bad a problem is that? We have no idea. Um, you can, I mean, you can do some stuff to play around with it to some extent, but I mean, in terms of like uh, uh, how widespread a problem is this in the literature for the predictions we make, we don't know. And you can, when you think about what happens, what happens if this is where your data is and climate change moves, moves there? You can't say anything meaningful. So, big problem, big problem. Um, and then we've got, of course, we've got bi inter biotic interactions, which take a chunk out of what we can infer. Dispersal limitation. Spatial sampling bias. Metapopulation processes, which are a big pain in the ass. We, we typically don't think about this very much. So if you've got, so if sink habitat is really common and dispersal is really common in your species, a lot of your occurrence points can actually occur in habitat that actually falls outside the fundamental niche. And if you only conserve that, your species is boned in the future. And then we've also got spatial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, just random uh, stochastic effects of sampling. So this is what your data may look like. That's what the thing you're trying to estimate looks like. And obviously, one thing is you can look at that and you can say, there's no way I'm going to get a good estimate of this from data that looks like that. And that's probably true. But the point here is a whole bunch of processes go into generating that spatial data, that, that distribution that you're drawing your data from, which is one of the reasons that people like to call these things distribution models. There's a bunch of processes generating that data. But to me, 
I mean, this, <laughs> there, there's an underlying point here about what the word model actually means, uh, leaving aside the word niche or distribution. Like, what does it mean to model something? To me, when I say we're modeling this, I mean the intent of producing whatever quantitative estimate we're producing is to infer the relationship between these two things. And to me, the, the relationship we're trying to infer is not about the distribution. And uh, I, I, I said this yesterday, but some of you weren't there yesterday. So if we just wanted to model a species spatial distribution, there's absolutely no reason to go through environmental variables. We could do a minimum convex polygon. We could do an interpolated density surface. We, 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 we know what the spatial dimensions are. They're x and y. They're lat and long. We don't need the environment to do a spatial model. Oh, and uh, Bon and McGill did this paper that I absolutely love, where they actually they took uh, distribution data for, if I remember correctly, as European birds. They made fake variables that amounted to northness and eastness, and they built models using commonly used niche modeling methods, just using northness and eastness. And they found you do every bit as good a job parameterizing a species distribution using those variables as you do based on the environment. So you can even use these methods on X and Y and get good models of species distributions. So why don't we do that? The answer is it's useless for most of the stuff we use these models for. If you want to predict the ability of a frog that lives here to invade Japan, and you make a strictly spatial model, what's that model tell you? It tells you your frog is going to be where you've seen it before, and it's not going to be where you haven't seen it before. Ditto the effects of climate change. It tells you nothing's going to change with climate change. So a strictly spatial model can't do a lot, what we, a lot of what we use these models for. So that means that when we build these models, we're not modeling that spatial process. We're saying there's something about the species relationship to environmental gradients here that is meaningful everywhere else that species might go and in the future and in the past. And that's the process among all those spatial processes that we're trying to model. And in a large extent, to a large extent, the better we do that, the better we'll do with the job we're trying to do with these models. And just to make that doubly clear, we're often extrapolating these things into conditions that have nothing in common with the training conditions except for the species itself. So the biotic interactions have changed. The historical biogeography bio has changed if it's happened there at all, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're saying there's something intrinsic, something in this model that measures something intrinsic to the species, right? So this is what I call the fundamental assumption of this stuff, which is to build a model in this method, in, in this this framework, and attempt interpolation or extrapolation from it. You have to make a fundamental assumption, which is that you have modeled some aspect of the species relationship to its environment that is intrinsic to the species and is consistent across time and space. Now, if you don't want to call that the niche, don't, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like a distribution to me. And, and the important bit here is that we realize that for most of the applications to which we put these models, our outcomes are going to be as good as our model of this thing is. Okay. Right, so who cares? Why should you give a crap about all this stuff? You know, I'm, that's a, I mean, it can be kind of a tedious point, but you should care <laughs> um, because that's getting at the very intent of this entire modeling paradigm. And if we want to get better at this stuff, we have to at, at, at least be clear at what we're trying to get better at. <clears throat> so in any given modeling effort, I think the first step, a good first step at least, would be to sit down and say, would I be happier with a model that really fits my distribution data if it's a poor estimate of the niche, if I knew that? Or would I be happier with a model that was a good estimate of the actual suitability of habitat, even if it doesn't currently fit the present day distribution of my species? Because there can be all those other spatial phenomena keeping it from out of here, right? Uh, um, and this could be a perfect estimate of the suitability of habitat for the species, even though it's not in all that. And if the answer is that you want to model the species environmental tolerances, you run up against a problem. <clears throat> and uh, I think this is not unappreciated. I know Rob Anderson worries about this a lot. Lobo worries about this a lot. A lot of other people worry about this. But there's an underappreciated problem at the center of this entire literature, uh, which is this problem of objective functions. So an objective function is it's a function. It tells you how well you've done at your objective. Uh, it's an easy way to remember it. So. We're measuring, it's something that tells you how good your model is at doing what you want it to do. And in our case, we're using a, AUC there. Yeah, I'm sorry. But we've also got the true skill statistic and Kappa and AIC and all these sorts of things. 
different ways of saying how well our model does its job. And uh, people argue back and forth about which of these are better, but they all suffer from the same fundamental problem, which is our data looks like this. So we collect some presence data there. We collect some absence or pseudo-absence data from there. And then we fiddle a model to it. Now the model is the orange bit. So all of our objective functions measure how well our model fits our data. But our data includes a lot of non-target processes, right? So this, this model says our species should be everywhere we've seen it, and it shouldn't be anywhere we haven't seen it. So by at the very least most of our objective functions, maybe not AIC, depending on how many parameters it's got, uh, by, by at least most, maybe all of our objective functions, that's a great model. But if your goal is to estimate the species of environmental tolerances, that model sucks, right? Whereas a true model that actually knew the truth of the species niche would get a really bad score by those objective functions because it's saying your species should be in places you haven't seen it before and it shouldn't be in places you have seen it before, which is that sink habitat. And this is a really serious problem. Now, a lot of people that, remember we did that AUC test thing where we set aside that subset of our data, and uh, uh, yeah. So that's a good thing to do. I'm not hating on AUC tests, but it's not as good as people think it is because it suffers from actually this exact same problem. So AUC will get you uh, away from some sort of stochastic effects of sampling and stuff like that. Sorry, AUC on test data. But you think about this. If you've got these processes in your data that are generating these patterns across the landscape, patterns of correlation with the environment, those patterns are present in your training data and your random sample, your, your test data. So you're still going to be evaluating your, on your model on how well it fits these non-target phenomena. So AUC on, on test data, again, it's, it's better than not doing it. It can control over parameterization to some extent, get rid of some of the, the sort of noise in your model, but it doesn't get you away from this. It doesn't tell you that you've estimated the niche well. So, big problem. Uh, we are trying to build, essentially, we're evaluating these models using species distributions, but we're using them very frequently as niche estimates, uh, um, which is a, a, bit, a bit of an issue. Uh, uh, but the problem is worse than that. So with what I've said so far, that might lead you to think, well, in any given modeling effort, I may have chose the, chosen the wrong model. You know, I may not have picked the best one from my set of candidate models. But the problem could be far more uh, uh, pervasive than that because we have decades, particularly the last decade, of methodological research in this area saying, how should I choose my environmental variables? How should I choose my study area? Which algorithm is best, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Almost all those studies are based on these exact same objective functions. So once we sort of realize the goal is to estimate the niche and the, the, and the uh, objective functions are estimating the distribution, which could actually be misleading, we've got a set of best practices, which actually could be misleading about the real best practices for our, the actual intention, usually, of our modeling, purpose, our, our modeling endeavors. So is everybody sad? All right. <laughs> well, the problem, of course, is that we don't know what else to do. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is here because I don't have, nobody has it. But you should be aware of the problem. We, the, the reason we're building these models in the first place is all oh, we've got is the distributional data, right? I mean, we, if we knew the truth of the, of the niche, if we had that to evaluate against, we wouldn't be doing this in the first place. And uh, that's, that's kind of where we stand right now. And I, I'm, I'm not, again, I can't tell you what the answer to this is. I, I hope the Decker stuff I'm working on it gets us a little further uh, uh, down that road, but it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, uh, and I don't want to make people so depressed they don't do this, because again, the goal here is to do something useful, not to do something perfect. But I think being aware of that sort of uh, uh, a core distinction between what you're trying to do and what these, these methods are re rewarding and what they're actually doing is, is essential to trying to do this stuff well. Because you've, you've got to, I mean, I just want to install, instill in you a level of skepticism about your own models. So, all right. So I, I guess I'm uh, done a little, about 10 minutes early here. Um, so these things are che cheap and easy to build. Um, uh, but... Yeah, and they can, can offer useful estimates of biological phenomena that we can't get otherwise. So this is one of those things where, like I, like I say, I sort of started in this area very skeptical about these things. And my initial goal in getting into this literature was just to make fun of them. But then I ended up using them a whole lot. Uh, and I think if you sort of look across this literature, I am constantly astonished by how often these things produce reasonable estimates of biology, apparently. You know? Things we can go out and validate 
with new field collection or with physiological data, or at the very least, things that make sense to experts in the field that the model didn't have available to it. I mean, so Chris Raxworthy has used this stuff to find new species repeatedly. Um, and so, yeah, it's like over and over again, I'm astonished at the fact these work as well as they do for all the problems that they've got under the hood. Uh, so I don't want to discourage people too much from that. Um, but I, I do want to just, I know I've hammered this point like 20 times now, but, but, but be, really, be really clear what the underlying concept of what you're trying to do here is, even if you know you can't do it well. And then, uh, um, yeah, again, I'm just repeating myself here. Be aware of that disconnect between what you're trying to do and, and what these methods actually do, because it's important. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I think that's it for this part of it. Uh, do we have any questions? Anybody? No? Just sadness, despair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? What do you do when you're in a Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? Well, the answer is we've got, I mean, well, um, the answer, I don't have the answer. The, uh, my answer would be, we've got a lot, again, we've got a lot of methodological studies uh, uh, on exactly that issue. And a lot of them seem, well, depending on which method you're using to actually reconstruct your model, some of them say, ah, it's not a problem, you know, don't worry about it. Other ones say, well, we have this, again, fairly rule of thumb kind of arbitrary cutoff that says, basically trim down your variable set so nothing's correlated with anything else more than 0 0.7, like a Pearson correlation coefficient. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, yeah, I, I'm checking this out here. Uh, like I've been sitting on this idea for like three or four years now. Uh, if one of you wants to just publish it and beat me to it, uh, fine, go ahead. <laughs> but I think, I think actually the, the, the idea that you take your big uh, data set with all your environmental variables and you trim it down to where you've got just those subsets that are mostly uncorrelated. Um, I'm not against the idea but it can have huge effects actually on the model you build. So there's this idea that if you've got a, like a, some sort of correlation coefficient of 0.95 or something like that, that means that this variable stands in for that variable really, really well. That's not necessarily the case when you're talking about the spatial prediction. Because the sort of implicit assumption there is that the residuals from that, from that uh, regression have no structure to them, which is something we're used to from working with sort of like, you know, uh, uh, X and Y data just doing linear regressions. We're used to thinking that way, but it's not true. The, the residuals from the relationships between those environmental variables actually have spatial structure. And so you can have two variables that are fairly highly correlated, and yet you can make very different spatial predictions with them. Yeah? So I don't, I, if, if someone has grappled with that idea in any sort of systematic context, or even sort of put it out there, I, have, I haven't read the paper yet. But, but uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tough thing to do. Honestly, my best answer, what I think is the best answer is, is try to know something about the species biology and figure out what's most relevant. Trim it down to that. Uh, but failing that, I mean, some of these methods do seem to deal with, with uh, 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 multicollinearity fairly well. And so, I don't know. I just, when in doubt, do it every possible way and look at your uncertainty. <laughs> That's my short answer to every methodological question. Uh, Diego. So uh, would you say that it, it is often the case that when you have an insightful paper that uses the species distribution model, mm. it is only insightful because it has some sort of post-validation assessment? Or can you, can, have you, do you know any paper that, is, that you would consider insightful that only use the SDM approach? Oh, wow. Um, like, like my, yeah, I, I would say, Yes, I mean, it depends on what you mean by insightful. You mean generating biological insight or something like that? Yeah, or? you were saying that you have, you, you had this paper where the guy who was using to predict the, the appearance of new species or... Rare yes, species. yeah, yeah, Raxworthy, yeah, yeah. But you said he used post-validation methods? Yeah, he went out looking, if I remember correctly, it's been probably five or six years from the paper, since I read the paper, uh, made models for a group of geckos or chameleons in Madagascar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and they predicted some, some new populations that no one had seen before, and they went out to look at those populations, and that species wasn't there, but a, a previously undescribed sister species was. And he did that uh, multiple times, I think. And, and, and that's very cool. Uh, I definitely think my, often my favorite papers are the ones that sort of tie it into some other stuff. But they're, I mean, I think insightful in terms of the modeling process or insightful in terms of the biology? Well, I guess the, the, the word I was trying to use is useful. Like, how do you know that prediction is useful? 
Um, I think actually, and this is one of the reasons I like you know looking at uncertainty. Uh, uh, I think if you use a whole bunch of different approaches and they all agree about this, it's probably true. Um, I think if you if you my own perception is that there is a strong omission bias for these uh, uh, models. So that if you build a model and it says a species could be there, at least in terms of that set of environmental variables, that's almost certainly true. Uh, um, I mean, unless you're doing something kind of crazy. It's, it's, it's usually true that the species could, could, could tolerate that set of environments. Uh, uh, I think often the, uh, the omissions are because there's a but are usually do those non-target processes. Um, uh, so I think you can do a lot of useful stuff with these with appropriate interpretation uh, as long as you're sort of looking at it through that lens. That could all change when you're extrapolating though, what I just said. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anybody else? I can go into the next part. Um, yeah. All right, cool. What's that? Oh, do people want to take a break? Yeah, no, take a five minute break.